Good evening and welcome to the Wigtown Book Festival for the Big Bang Weekend. Uh, my name is Stuart Kelly, I'm a writer and critic and it's a real pleasure to be here with David Chalmers. I hope David won't take it adversely if I say that I think his book Reality Plus reminded me of 17th century books like Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy or Thomas Brown's urn burials. It is so full, it is so hugely uh, diverse in what it tells us. I thought this was one of the most intriguing books and I can prove it. Look how many pages I had to fold down to think, now there's something to think about. So please join me in welcoming David Chalmers. Well, thank you so much, Stuart. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure to be uh, speaking here at the Wigtown Book Festival. It's a shame uh, I can't be there uh, in person. On the other hand, in, to be there in person in the beautiful location you have there. On the other hand, you know, this technology is making possible, making it possible to be at so many more events that one couldn't be at otherwise. And I'm glad I just have the chance to, uh, to be talking with you today. I do have some slides which didn't appear to be to be loading before, but let's see if they uh, let's just see if they do. Uh, no luck. Nothing is uh, nothing is showing up. Okay, then I will just uh, I will just talk, which will be just as good anyway. Hopefully, I'm um, sure it will be. Uh, might I ask first of all, are you real? Am I real? I am conscious, and that is as real as it gets, being a, uh, being a conscious being. That gives me, I think, therefore I am. It doesn't yet give me you, so I'm still having some doubts. You might just be a, uh, you might just be a video file or a bot, for all I know. Let me test this. Continue the sequence. One, two, three, four, five. Six? No? Okay. He's a bot. He's a bot. It's a recording. Stuart just filed a recording and left us uh, <laughs> left us here to go. Okay, we have proof. Okay, so my book well, is a reality plus. Yeah. Uh, virtual worlds and the problems of philosophy, and really, it's a philosophical inquiry into uh, virtual worlds and virtual reality, and an attempt to think to use technology to use you know virtual reality technology to come to grips with some very traditional philosophical problems about reality. What is reality? How can we know anything about the external world? What's the relationship between mind and body? And the book is very much intended to be like an interaction between technology and philosophy, what I call techno-philosophy, where, um, where we use technology to shed light on philosophical questions. And at the same time, we think philosophically about the technology of the day. As a philosopher, I think, you know, every new technology raises so many philosophical questions. I mean, certainly the computer, the internet, the smartphone, artificial intelligence, all of these raise philosophical questions. And virtual reality does this as much as anything. We're now able to create artificial realities, human constructed artificial realities. What does that mean? Are they, are they real? What's their status? Can we live meaningful lives in them? So my book is really, I mean, one part of it is just to use technology as an introduction to philosophy, to introduce some of the big issues of philosophy, make you think about them, and maybe actually offer solutions of my own to some of the questions. The other part is a philosophical reflection on virtual reality technology. And that's maybe the part I'll focus most on today in these, uh, in these opening remarks. And what is virtual reality? I mean, first of all, I'll define a virtual world. A virtual world is a immersive, sorry, is an interactive computer generated world. Anytime you play a video game, you're interacting with a, uh, with a virtual world. If you, uh, use things like, uh, you know, World of Warcraft or uh, Minecraft, or if you're a bit older, Second Life, then you've, 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 uh, you've interacted 
with virtual worlds, computer-generated three-dimensional worlds that you get to interact with, maybe play games, maybe socialize. Virtual worlds are not yet virtual realities. Um, those virtual worlds are mostly experienced on a two-dimensional computer screen. The new technology of the day is virtual reality that, uh, that adds the extra feature that virtual realities are immersive. They're immersive three-dimensional worlds that you experience from the inside as if you were there. And typically these days, virtual reality is experienced with a virtual reality headset, such as, for example, the uh, Oculus Quest, recently renamed the MetaQuest. Uh, when Facebook renamed itself Meta. Here is a, here's my own Oculus Quest. I put it on and suddenly I am immersed in a wholly different virtual world and I can experience things around me. I can interact with other people via my avatars, a digital body and theirs in a virtual world. We can, we can certainly play games, we can socialize, we can go on quests. We can uh, we can hold conversations and conferences, and really, it's like it's like inhabiting a new world. So that's virtual reality, and virtual reality just raises so many questions. Number one is virtual reality real, or is it somehow just a mere second class reality? I mean, there's a long tradition of saying virtual realities are mere illusions or hallucinations or fictions, that if you're in virtual reality, that may be fine for gaming, but it's basically a form of escapism. It's not real life. We even have these expressions like IRL, you know, in real life, contrasting the real world with the digital world, which by implication is not real. I want to reject that way of looking at these things. And in this book, my central thesis is virtual reality is genuine reality. It's first class reality. It's not exactly the same as physical reality or it needn't be, but it's on a par. It's just as real. Digital reality is just as real as physical reality. And in fact, you can have, a, you can in principle lead a meaningful life in a virtual world or a virtual reality. When thinking about this, I find it useful to use two classic virtual worlds from science fiction as a touchstone, uh, the matrix and the metaverse. The matrix, uh, you all know the matrix from the original 99 movie by the Wachowski sisters recently followed up by two sequels in 2003 and another one just a couple of months ago. The matrix is wonderful for the way it illustrates what's sometimes called the simulation hypothesis. The idea that we could be living in a giant computer simulation right now. Uh, we could actually be in a situation like the Matrix. You know, Neo in the movie is hooked up uh, to a giant computer simulation. His body is in a pod. He's connected to a simulated world. And that just raises, once you see this illustrated, you know, that just raises the question, could we ourselves be in a simulation like that? Could all this be a computer simulation? This is wonderful for a philosopher because it's very reminiscent of some big questions that Rene Descartes uh, asked, actually way just back in the, uh, in the 17th century, uh, the period that Stuart was, uh, was referring to in his meditations on first philosophy in the 1640s. Uh, Descartes asked, how do we know that anything around us is real? How do we know that we're not being fooled by an evil demon to thinking all of this is real when in fact, None of, it's, none of it's out there. These days we ask Descartes' question through the key of technology by asking, how do we know we're not in the matrix? How do we know we're not in a computer simulation? We could be in a computer simulation where none of this is real. And I have a kind of a good news, a bad news, good news attitude towards this idea we're in a computer simulation. I do think it's a serious possibility that we are in a computer simulation. I don't say we are certainly, in such a simulation, but I certainly don't think we can rule it out. And in the book, I argue that we could never prove that we're not in a simulation. You may think, ah, there's something that proves you're not in a simulation. Maybe you're a, your partner or your cat or the beautiful 
uh, the beautiful hills of Scotland. Um, but, you know, once you think about it, I think all that in principle could be simulated. It's hard to see why in principle, you know, uh, there couldn't be a simulation technology is actually getting better and better all the time. It's not yet indistinguishable from physical reality, but give it a few decades. I would not, um, you know, I would not bet against it becoming indistinguishable from physical reality. Before long, we're actually going to have the technology to build these simulated universes, potentially indistinguishable from physical reality. And that will just make the question, are we in such a simulation all the more pressing? I think this is one way actually in which the technology is an advance on you know, what Descartes was thinking in the uh, 17th century. For Descartes, all this was hypothetical possibilities. An evil demon could fool me. But now as the simulation technology is advancing, it's actually it's moving from you know, science fiction to science fact. Yeah, the, uh, the, the physical worlds, the worlds that I inhabit through this Oculus Quest are right now somewhat cartoonish and primitive, and you can certainly tell that they're virtual, but you know, as the technology advances, they may well be indistinguishable. There's also a point made by the philosopher Nick Bostrom that over the course of history, there may actually be many more simulated universes than unsimulated universes many more simulated beings and unsimulated beings. And then you ask, well, what are the odds that I'm one of the lucky ones who's at ground zero, unsimulated? You might think it's actually much more likely that I'm in a simulation. So anyway, in the book, one of the first things I try to do when thinking about the matrix um, is to argue that, yeah, we can't know that we're not in a simulation like the matrix. It's a serious possibility. I think at one point when I asked to put a figure on it, I say, maybe maybe 25% probability that we're in a simulation. Happy to go into that further when we talk. But okay, that's the, that's the first main claim of the book. We could be in um, a virtual reality ourselves. Our own reality could be a virtual reality for all we know. You don't have to believe that it is. And as I said, you know, I'm not exactly, I wouldn't claim to be at all certain about that myself. But I think the possibility that all this is virtual then raises many questions. If we are in a virtual reality, does that mean that none of this is real? Does that mean our lives are an illusion? And that would be a traditional way to think about, uh, to think about, say, the matrix. But I want to argue that if we're in the matrix or if we're in a computer simulation, nonetheless, everything we're interacting with um, is real. The world around us is real. I'm still in a world of tables and chairs and there's books and a globe and a painting and a lamp. Um, and all that is still here. I'm still really talking to, uh, to Stuart or to his bot friend we sent along. Um, so really, in the matrix, we're still having conversations and, uh, and relationships. And I would argue that, yeah, even in a computer simulation, all this is real. So that's the good news. The bad news is we might be in a simulation. The good news is, even if we are in a simulation, the world around us is real. Yeah, yeah, there's still tables and chairs and other people. Now, it is true that if we're in a simulation, the world's somewhat different from what we thought. And in particular, if we're in a simulation, then we're living in a digital world where uh, the processes around us are ultimately you know, made of digital processes. The interaction of bits, ones and zeros in some computer process may actually underlie our reality. That's an idea that some physicists have taken seriously. They call it the it from bit idea, that reality is made from bits. That's an idea that I take seriously too. But importantly, I take that to be a world where the objects, the physical world is still there. It's just a hypothesis about what it's made of. It's made of bits. This is not a reality in which it's an illusion, an illusion or a hallucination. So that's the second part of my claim. Things that happen in virtual reality, you know, objects in virtual realities are real. They're not illusions. They're not hallucinations. This also applies not just to the extreme case of the matrix, but to, you know, to real down-to-earth virtual reality technology of the kind we have now and that we're now building. You know, many, you know, recently Facebook renamed itself to, uh, to Meta to express their quest to build the so-called metaverse. The metaverse is a virtual reality world 
introduced by the science fiction writer Neil Stevenson in his 1992 novel Snow Crash. Um, and that was a world, it wasn't a world like the Matrix where people had been in this their whole lives. Rather, it was a, world, a virtual world that people made that you could then enter and inhabit and you know, carry on relationships, um, get a job, um, build communities, um, make money, and so on. It was basically a very large virtual world, a very large virtual reality, which was in many ways continuous with physical reality. And many there now seems to be this race on to build analogs to Stevenson's metaverse. That is virtual worlds that you might access through a virtual reality headset or augmented reality glasses where the glasses project the virtual world around you, but that will become continuous with physical reality. The uh, Another science fiction writer, uh, William Gibson, back in 1982, uh, talked about virtual reality under the label cyberspace. He introduced the label cyberspace, originally meaning virtual reality. And he said, he said, um, cyberspace is a consensual hallucination. It's a hallucination of billion peoples, a billion people around the world. That's the view again that I want to to uh, to combat, even as much in the case of the metaverse as in the case of the matrix. I think in these virtual worlds that we're creating. They needn't be illusions. They needn't be hallucinations. They can be perfectly real worlds made of with populated by digital entities. I think when I enter into a virtual world, even now with my, uh, with my Oculus Quest, I think I can already be interacting with genuine digital objects, um, also interacting with you know, real pe people, building real relationships in uh, at least in you know multi user virtual realities so there i want to argue also with respect to the coming metaverse coming virtual realities the ones that we actually build then they needn't be illusions or hallucinations what goes on there can be perfectly real the final thing that i the final central thesis of this book i mean the book has many different theses and many different avenues as a uh, as Stuart was, uh, was saying, but thinking of these three theses as the back, backbone of the book. The third is that you can actually live a meaningful life in a virtual reality. So I mean, to start with the extreme case, the matrix again, I think people who live their lives in a simulated world like the matrix are still leading a meaningful life, having real relationships. They have projects that matter and so on there. And the same goes for, um, the virtual realities that we're uh, that we're building today, people have already you know there are a lot of people who spent say a lot of time in worlds like say Second Life. They've built uh, and that has not been necessarily escapism for them at all. People have built communities that really matter for them. In Second Life, oppressed groups um, have often you know got together and you know, come together to overcome oppression with a basis in. Uh, in Second Life, uh, LBGTQ people have experimented with new identities um, in this world. <laughs> this is all very real. Um, actually, there's a great moment in the in the movie that came out last year, Free Guy, where there's two characters in a turn out to be in a video <sighs> game world, and they're actually non-player characters themselves. But one of them says to the other, "Does that mean none of this is real?" And the other one says, look, I'm sitting here with my best friend trying to help get him through a tough time. If that's not real, I don't know what is. So I would argue in virtual realities and virtual worlds, you can have real uh, you know, relationships with, uh, with friends, with, uh, with family. You can build real communities. You can build relationships and projects. Roughly all the sources of value, or at least many of the sources of value, in physical reality can in principle be present in virtual reality. I think as conscious beings, we invest our worlds with meaning. We can invest the physical world with meaning, but we can do that to a, uh, to a virtual world too. So if sometime in the future, maybe a hundred years in the future, people have the option of spending large amounts of their life in virtual reality and carrying on many of their everyday life activities there. I think you know, for some people, it'll be a reasonable choice. It won't be for everybody. Some people have a, have a preference for, you know, for nature, for non-artificial environments. You won't find that 
exactly in VR. People like that might prefer physical reality. Um, maybe you've got preferences for worlds of some kind of history or for the kind of embodiment that you find in, in physical reality. Maybe some of those things over time will become present in virtual reality as well, where we'll have you know, new forms of embodiment in digital bodies that uh, in some ways go beyond what we have with physical bodies. But anyway, I don't want to say virtual reality has to be better than physical reality, but I want to say in principle, they're roughly on a par. Some people may prefer one, some people may prefer another. I'm also not saying virtual worlds are going to be wonderful utopias. All I'm saying is they'll be meaningful. I suspect that they will support the full range of the human condition. You know, physical reality does. A lot of physical reality is awful. Some of it is wonderful. My, my claim is that experiences in virtual worlds and virtual realities can likewise run the gamut from wonderful to awful. It's a real, I mean, it's an in, in, interesting and important open question in its own right, whether, you know, virtual realities will end up being utopias or dystopias. They've got such potential for both. You know, new forms of embodiment, new worlds with um, totally new environments, potentially infinite space and abundance of goods. That's utopian. But then you start thinking about dystopian elements. They may be made by corporations which are monetizing us, manipulating us for corporate profits, potentially no privacy in these worlds because whoever created the worlds has complete control and complete knowledge of those worlds. There's room for all kinds of inequality uh, to come into these worlds. You can already see the way that people are, you know, that markets are trying to take over virtual worlds via things like, you know, the non-fungible token that, that takes an object that might be abundant for everybody and makes it, uh, makes it non-duplicable so that markets can come in and, uh, and impose their forms of artificial scarcity. So, I'm, so just for this brief summary here, then I don't want to say that virtual worlds are going to be dystopias. I don't want to say they're going to be utopias. I think probably there are going to be something like the internet, which has brought wonderful things and awful things. In the case of the internet, I'd like to think the net balance has been positive, despite all the downsides. I guess my hope is that for the metaverse of virtual worlds, the net balance will also be positive. But I think that's very much up to us in the coming decades of working with and thinking about these virtual worlds, trying to build a future in these virtual worlds where, where all of humanity can, uh, can flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, David. Um, one thing I admired so much about your book was the humility of it, saying, we just don't know yet. My first question, and I'll have very few questions because I would like people to be able to come in and speak with you. My father had a great mentor and he said, if they think it's real, it's real to them. And I always counter it by saying, well, what if somebody is thinking something which is absolutely unreal? So how do you distinguish between the subjective internal form of reality and somebody who is really actually going a bit crazy? Yeah, it's, a, it's an important question. I think... And this idea that it's real to you, that's saying, well, there is something which is real. That is my, if I just say I hallucinate a pink elephant in front of me when no uh, pink elephant is actually there, then I'd say the elephant is not real. But I would say, yeah, the elephant is still real to me. And what that means really is saying my conscious experience of the elephant is real. The appearing of the elephant to me is real, even if the elephant is not. I mean, there are some philosophers who've wanted to say all there is to reality is what happens in our consciousness. George yes. Barclay yeah. said appearance is reality. Or essays and received. Samuel Johnson wonderfully said, I refute it thus. And kicked, and kicked the stone, that's right. Yeah. And thereby had the conscious experience of feeling 
the stone. But I, I, I'm actually on, to some extent, I'm on Johnson's side here. I think there has to be reality outside the mind for it to really count as reality. Otherwise, you just have consciousness. But I think it's important to us to be interacting with something outside our consciousness. Yeah, the extreme case, otherwise you get the case of, say, a dream. In a dream, we are interacting with a simulation, with a re kind of reality. It's a, bit, a dream is a bit like a computer simulation where the simulation is actually devised by your own brain. It throws up a simulation for you to interact with. But in that case, everything you're interacting with is inside your mind. You don't get outside your mind. So I'd say a dream or a hallucination is not fully real. In virtual reality, in physical reality, by contrast, I think we actually have physical processes outside our mind we're interacting with. And I'd say the same for virtual reality. It's not just that in virtual reality we have these appearances. We actually have real digital processes out there in the world that we're interacting with in VR. So I think that's a very important criterion of reality that virtual reality can satisfy. Can I ask a question about ethics? Sure. Um, you have stated in the book that you think that virtual entities are the same as real entities. If I made a virtual kitten and kicked the heck out of it, should that kitten have virtual rights or ethical rights? You know, to what extent can you exploit something in a virtual world? It's an interesting question. I mean, the virtual kittens that we have today, say, in a virtual reality, are basically, you know, they're very cartoonish and very simple. They're basically uh, algorithms. Very usually. No, really... you kick them. <laughs> well, I think it's an interesting question. If you do kick a virtual kitten, which is just an algorithm. Just say you kick a picture of a kitten. Is, does that make you a bad person? Well, I'd say you haven't actually heard it yet. <laughs> it, might, it might suggest there's something wrong with you if you're the kind of person who wants to go around kicking pictures of kittens. And I'd say the same thing if you went around kicking the kind of, just say you had a robot kitten. Or just say you kick, you know, there are robot vacuum cleaners we have now, Roombas. If you kick your Roomba, are you hurting your Roomba? No, I don't think it, because the Roomba is not conscious. You're not hurting the Roomba. But there is something very pathological about, you know, about kicking a Roomba. And I'd say the same for, say, virtual kittens right now in virtual reality. They're simple algorithms like a Roomba. They're not conscious. But if we go to the virtual kittens we may have 50 years in the future, once artificial intelligence is developed, I think in principle there could eventually be virtual kittens as sophisticated, as complicated as biological kittens with like simulations of kitten brains and so on. At that point, I think it's entirely possible those kittens could actually be conscious beings that can consciously feel pain and suffer and so on. At that point, if you kick a virtual kitten, you'll actually be harming that being and making, them, and making it suffer. And that, I think, would be a much worse moral sin. You write extremely well about artificial intelligence. I'd like to ask about artificial empathy. Mm. Will the machine ever develop empathy or is it just a series of algorithms and a series of calculations yeah well who's to say that our own empathy you know isn't itself rooted at some level in processes in our brains that involve algorithms and calculations i once had a conversation with the uh, the robot sophia i don't know if i'm uh, if uh, some people have come across Sophia, who looks very, very human-like, and in particular has a marvelous array of facial expressions, so that when you're talking to her, it really feels like she's listening to you and <laughs> paying attention, and maybe even has some empathy. But it's not. That's just a, that's that's just some simple algorithms. There's no way that's real empathy, and that shows how how much we can get sucked in by anything with a face and eyes and so on into attributing emotions to it. But I don't see why. It shouldn't be the case that, again, once genuine artificial intelligence is developed, there couldn't be a robot that perceives us and reacts to us and actually has its own emotions. In when it sees us, perceives us as happy, it will itself become happy and so on. That's at least the beginnings of... Uh, the be they think they say that imitation is at least the beginnings of empathy. And once we're there, 
I at least wouldn't rule out that eventually machines could have genuine empathy. Yes, I mean, we're still in the uncanny valley, but um, it is an interesting point about whether or not empathy or emotions are things that can be coded ever. But uh, I'd like to move on to one of the things that intrigued me most about your book, because of my background, theology. Mm -hmm. Did God simulate the universe? Yeah, you know, when you think about this simulation hypothesis that we are in a computer simulation like the Matrix, the question just immediately arises, well, who made the simulation? It seems like there has to be a simulator. And once you start thinking about the simulator, at least the simulator has some of the properties of a traditional god. I mean, they created our world. They're potentially all-powerful. Maybe they can change the simulation potentially all-knowing. They could know what's going on in the simulation. On the other hand, the simulator needn't especially be all good or all wise. It could just be a teenage hacker in the next universe up, as I talk about in the uh, in the book. We got a picture of a, uh, yeah, a teenage girl hacking away on our computer and bringing wonderful new realities into existence. Okay, she may end up being the god of that simulated world, should we build a work? Should we build a religion around this simulator? I would say no. Um, you know, I, I don't think we should worship the simulator. Maybe the simulator is more like what sometimes gets called in religious discussions a demiurge, the uh, they're like the sub god, the deputy god who uh, is somewhere underneath the big cosmic god that runs the cosmos, but does the work of creating our universe and so on. But for me, I'm I'm not myself at all religious. I don't myself. I'm not find myself inclined to believe in a God, but thinking about simulations has actually take, made me take the idea of a, a God, a creator, more seriously than I did before. Many uh, contemporary theologians are now very interested in simulation theory, in virtual realities, because they think it's, well, they always said nature pours a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And this seems like the best vacuum to put our new God into. That, you know, we're just part of this cosmic experiment, which strikes me as borderline sadistic. <laughs> sadistic I mean, on God's part? Yeah. I mean, that, that's why I was asking the question about the kicking the virtual cat. Mm. And actually, you can make that much worse. I mean, could I hit a virtual woman? Well, personally, I would not. But if there is no physical substance, is there no ethical duty? Yeah, my own view is that ethics is just as serious inside a virtual world as inside a non-virtual world. In fact, you know, even in real life, virtual worlds that we have today, such as the ones that Meta has been creating, Horizon Worlds, they've had cases of that get reported as basically sexual assaults within virtual worlds where one person violates another person's um, physical body. Uh, sorry, one person's virtual body. And this is experienced as traumatic by the people who, who experience it. And I think, um, yeah, this has happened a few times in the history of virtual worlds. People have thought that who does this, the people who do this should be punished or banned. Uh, Meta has now introduced new four-foot boundaries around their, their avatars so that people can't interfere with each other. So I think the ethics of virtual worlds, in principle, just as serious as that in physical worlds. And it does mean that, yeah, whoever creates a virtual world, like with it, including creating all the people within it, has a whole lot of responsibility and a whole lot to answer for. I think that's true, whether or not they're, whether they're a simulator who creates a digital world or whether they're a traditional god who creates a physical world. Either way, they're, they're playing god, as they say. They're bringing lives into existence. They're bringing suffering into existence. Whoever created this world, if they did, brought the Holocaust into existence. Does that make them a, uh, a monster? It's a, I mean, it's such a complex question. You might take the view that as long as you bring into balance more of a balance of happiness over suffering, as long, then 
you've done you've done a good thing. But uh, at the very least, I hope there are going to be you know, serious ethical regulations governing the uh, you know the virtual worlds that we're going to be in a position to create in the future. And I hope that whoever created this world was subject to such ethical regulations too. Just before we move on to the questions from the audience, the mind-body dichotomy that, um, you know, your book is Reality Plus, and it says the problems of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that has been one of the really big questions, you know, since Descartes mm -hmm. was put on the table, or... Plato and the Timaeus. What I'm interested in is the extent to which you think the brain and the mind are absolutely the same thing. Or does the mind extend beyond the grey mush up there? Yeah, this is actually my day job. Thinking about uh, thinking about the the mind, for, you know, for two or three decades now, I've thought a lot about uh, about consciousness, the mind, and its relationship to the body. This reality thing is relatively new uh, for me. And there, I've actually tried to argue that yeah, the mind and the brain should not the mind should not just be identified with the brain. And there's a couple of respects I think actually in which that's true. Both of which I discussed in this book. First, I want to argue that <coughs> consciousness cannot be fully explained by processes in our brain. It's very deeply connected to them, but the subjective experience I have of being a person in a world, experiencing images and sounds and feelings, I want to argue that nothing about the interaction with neurons will ever fully explain how we're, how we're conscious. So I want to argue that consciousness involves something over and above processes in the brain, maybe some fundamental properties of reality. Uh, just as space and time and matter are fundamental, I've argued maybe consciousness has to be seen as fundamental as well. At the same time, I've also wanted to argue that even focusing on the brain, we shouldn't see the brain as the boundary or the limit of the cognitive system. The environment can become part of our, part of our minds as well. For example, the smartphone, you know, my, uh, my smartphone now, Boy, it's, it just does so much of the work my brain used to do. It remembers phone numbers for me, <laughs> it navigates, it helps me make plans, decisions, schedules, and so on. This smartphone, I say, is taking up you know, a good 20 or 30% of my mind these days. So I think you know, there's no special boundary about the, uh, about the brain. So I think yeah, the mind can extend beyond the brain in a number of ways. Well, I'm going to go to a question we've had in from Candy Robinson. Uh, you said there is about a 25% chance we're already in a computer simulation. If we say we are, then are we now making simulations within simulations? And why would we need to do that? Yeah, it's an Clever interesting question. question. Yeah, this idea that simulations can be embedded within simulations. I mean, it's absolutely true that if we're in a simulation and then... We make a simulation, even a simple simulated world, like a virtual reality world, then we're, we've created a simulation within a simulation. If we ever create a full-scale universe, that'll be a giant simulation within a simulation. Some people have suggested that we should do this because that might be a way to figure out whether we're in a simulation. Basically, what we're going to be doing is overloading the simulation in the next universe up by running our own simulations and see if we can get it to you know, glitch out or something with the, uh, the energy overload. And some people have thought maybe then that would produce some glitches and that we could use to know we're in a simulation. Other people have said we shouldn't do this because um, maybe they'll use this as a reason to terminate the simulation if it becomes too, uh, oh, it becomes too expensive. So don't make simulations within a simulation. But yeah, it's entirely possible that if we are in a simulation, that whoever created us is in a simulation of their own. Could be simulations within simulations within simulations. Um, yeah, then there's an interesting question, how deep in the hierarchy of simulations are we? Are we level 42? Are we, is, it, is it an infinite chain of simulations? You know, as, as somebody once said, the world stands on the back of a turtle. 
which stands on the back of another turtle and it's turtles all the way down. Could it be simulations all the way up? That was dear old Terry Pratchett. Hmm. But uh, in terms of that 25% figure, is that based on Nick Bostrom's work? The reasoning is somewhat similar, yeah. Nick Bostrom has this argument that basically we should expect there will be many simulations under certain conditions. Like if everything goes according to plan, if we develop the technology and if we use the technology, then ultimately there'll be many more simulated beings than unsimulated beings. Um, so Bostrom says either most beings will be simulations or for some reason we won't develop the technology or we won't use it. And then, he's, then he assigns his own probabilities to each of those hypotheses. That is something somewhat similar. And the, my argument here is definitely inspired by Bostrom's. Um, I think he leaves out a couple of considerations. One major consideration to whether we're in a simulation is whether simulated beings can themselves be conscious. I don't think this is obvious. If simulated beings can't be conscious, then we can't be in a we can't ourselves be simulated beings. Why? Because we know we're conscious. So that would rule out the hypothesis we're in a simulation. So that's one, you know, that's one other way to escape this. So the way I think about I divide it up into two possibilities. First, either question one, are human-like conscious simulations even possible? Two, if they're possible, will we we create them? And I actually assign 50% credence to each of those. 50% chance that these simulations are possible, 50% chance that if they're possible, some beings will create them. Putting those together, I get a 25% chance that both those things will happen, which will result in a 25% chance that most beings like me in this universe are simulated. And from there, it's not a hard step to there being about a 25% chance that I myself am simulated. So that's how I get to the 25%. It's not really meant to be exact science, but at least gives you an idea for a reason for taking it seriously. It seems to me in some ways a zero-sum game. Whether I'm simulated or real, I still have to behave. I still have to have my principles. Yeah. And, you know, whether I'm a digital avatar from some teenager in a metaverse or an incorporated human form, it doesn't matter. You still do the right thing. We've got another question just come through from Julian. There seems to be a cultural or societal drive to make simulations. How does that reflect on us as a species? Boy, that's right. a yeah. that's human species, not, you know, marmosets. Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um, why do we want to make uh, so many simulations? I mean, boy, I guess it, this started from, you know, we liked art, we liked paintings, we liked representing ourselves and representing things. Then we write novels. That's a so interesting question. Is the urge to make simulations, is it continuous with the urge to make paintings and novels and build representations, build artificial worlds? I mean, simulations are also incredibly useful. Um, well, they, let's see, where are they useful? We build simulations for scientific purposes all the time. Increasingly large amounts of science is done through simulations. So that's one motivation, but I mean, a lot of them are made for entertainment. Video games involve, involve these very intricate virtual worlds, largely for the purposes of entertainment. We love interacting with these, uh, these virtual worlds. I guess I think one of the biggest impetuses besides simulations is it enables us to interact with new realities. Not just, you know, the physical reality is great, you know, but that's just original reality. The point of reality plus is we now have all these new realities to, uh, to interact with. And I think we're drawn to, ex to be able to experience artificial realities. Even in a book or a movie, to some extent, you get to inhabit and experience a new reality. But with with virtual reality technology, you somehow actually get to live it. And so maybe this, I don't know exactly what this means about us as a species, but we love exploring new things and new worlds. Yes, it reminds me of the nutshell studies, those weird doll's houses uh, of murder scenes. 
that the CIA still used to train people. Sorry, the FBI, not the CIA. Um, we are drawn to create worlds to understand the bigger world. And you wonder occasionally whether the smaller worlds are actually more representative of what we are as a species. You know, that we reflect ourselves in miniature rather than looking beyond. Yeah, this is, these are the virtual worlds which are basically copies of the original world where we... And this is, yeah, Bostrom talks about the idea of an ancestor simulation, where we just build a simulation to be a perfect reflection of, say, the history of the world of our ancestors. And maybe this is a bit like the dollhouse case. It's like it's a miniature replica of our world. But I think that's, that's one possible use of virtual worlds. But it would be a real shame to limit virtual reality technology basically to replicas of our world. I think one of the exciting things about virtual worlds is all the ways they can be entirely different from our world. You know, I mean, we can do all things like flying and anti-gravity in virtual worlds. We can inhabit wholly new bodies. We can have worlds with, we can teleport. We can do worlds that have entirely new forms of life. And I think in the long run, it may well be that those will be some of the virtual worlds that people will be drawn to will be virtual worlds with entirely new forms of life. The philosopher Jean Baudrillard talked about in his book, Simulation and Simulacra, yeah. <laughs> he talked about representations that correspond to a direct reality and then simulacra, which don't correspond to any reality at all. And he was kind of down on simulacra because they don't correspond to an existing reality. But I think maybe simulacra are what are actually super exciting. They're wholly new forms of reality. But of course, Baudrillard famously uh, said that the uh, war in Iraq didn't happen. And given what's going on in the world today, I wonder, are you hopeful or do you think we will all just retreat into the shell of a virtual world because the real world is so wretched? I mean, it's certainly true that there are plenty of reasons for, uh, for pessimism in, uh, in recent years, both of what's going on in physical reality and this phenomenon of fragmentation where people fragment into their, their own groups with their own beliefs. I guess I'm enough of an optimist to hope, this is a, to hope this is temporary, that there really is an objective reality out there. I mean, in this physical world, there is a physical reality that we all share, and there is objective truth about it. I mean, there really is a war in Ukraine going on. That's not a, uh, that's not a matter of, uh, of opinion. I think that's a matter of, uh, that's a matter of fact. Um, and I hope that in the long run, the truth, uh, the truth wins out. It's an interesting question, though, to what extent virtual reality has to be a retreat from the physical world. I certainly think in the short term, we will spend our time in some combination of physical reality and virtual reality. And in many ways, there'll be uh, continuous relationships in one domain will continue in the other domain. So I would like to think of, you know, reality plus as an augmentation of the original reality, original physical reality very much not a replacement for it. I think if we, if we, you know, if we, we should not be, uh, we don't want to neglect the physical world. That would be a disaster. I think enough of us are actually going to be drawn to the physical world, that there'll be a lot of incentive to take that seriously. And then the question is, will we be able to solve our problems in the, uh, in the physical world? And there, I don't have any special enlightenment to add, except to say, I very much hope so. In terms of how the book works, oh, sorry, we've got another question coming in from Daniel. What virtual worlds do you use and enjoy? And yeah, given... well, okay, let's, let's, let's think especially about, say, the virtual reality worlds that I use with, the, with say, this, uh, this Oculus Quest headset. Actually, around the, um, around the beginning of the pandemic, I started meeting up with a bunch of friends from around the world in VR every week, and we still have a weekly uh, a weekly appointment to do this for an hour or so every uh, every Thursday. And yeah, we've experimented with a. It's actually a, a, a number of other academic philosophers in in Australia and in, in the UK and the uh, in the US. Um, 
And we've experimented with a number of platforms. Actually, you know, many of them are, are games. I love uh, playing Beat Saber, this world, this game where you uh, slash the, the cubes coming towards you to music with your lightsaber. Um, that's extremely enjoyable. But we've also explored a number of social platforms, um, which are especially relevant, I think, for this metaverse idea. There's a VR chat and a old space VR, big screen, all of which are good in different ways. Rec room where you can play games. I'd say none of them is yet at the level of sophistication of, say, of a virtual world, the size and complexity of a virtual world, like, say, Second Life was. Second Life is not immersive. It's You don't experience it through a headset. But I'd say we're all waiting for uh, for those new virtual worlds. I mean, last, there's all kinds of game worlds which are so much fun to use. Last week, I experimented for the first time with a, the new mini golf, walkabout mini golf, where you get to play a game of mini golf in VR. Yeah, that ball is just as frustratingly difficult to get into the hole as it is in a real mini golf. So uh, yeah, the physics is really quite good. So I'd say it's been a combination actually of game worlds and social worlds. One nice thing that's been happening since my book came out is a few people have said, hey, can, I, can I interview you in VR? I even had lunch with one journalist in, uh, in VR where we had to, uh, we had virtual sushi, which is not unfortunately very tasty in a virtual restaurant and supplemented it by eating some physical sushi in the physical world. And that worked out okay. Well, we're almost drawing to a close. And I would like to ask you really about optimism in your book, because you are very cautious. And I think there's something very joyful about your caution in saying, you know what? I don't know. Um, do you think that we are heading in the right direction in terms of our use of technology and our use of virtual worlds and our use of any kind of augmentation? It's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, up until, say, 10 years ago, I would have said, probably unambiguously, yes. I think, you know, the internet has been an amazing thing that's brought so much to so many people. Um, it's enabled new forms of communication, new uh, new communities. I mean, yeah, there, there were some, uh, some downsides, but I'd say that to a very considerable extent, the internet represented progress. Now, I guess over the last 10 years, we've seen more causes for pessimism. I mean, especially tied to social media, which people think can make people miserable, uh, can make them fragmented, can make them uh, can make them manipulated, um, and can also have serious effects on the political scene with fragmentation. So I guess there are causes for concern now. I guess I'd still like to say that the overall effects of technology have been clearly positive. But when it comes to virtual worlds, I think you know there are very serious reasons for worry as well as reasons for hope. And I worry very much about especially the role of, say, corporations in constructing these virtual worlds whose incentives are very much those of yeah, monetization. If we get free access to them, then we're being monetized and we're probably being manipulated. And can you really lead a genuine, free, autonomous life if you're being manipulated? So I very much hope there are going to be paths to, you know, there are going to be virtual worlds which are not controlled by, uh, by corporations, maybe user, user governed, user controlled, virtual worlds, but it's an open question how you get there. And, you know, the market forces are going to be, uh, are going to be very strong. Maybe the latest and greatest VRs are always going to be made by, uh, by corporations. I think, yeah, I guess, I think there are a lot of open, uh, there are a lot of open questions there, but there's also so much potential in virtual worlds. You know, people will be liberated in various ways. You already say people who are, uh, you know, aging people or disabled people have often found you know, kind of access to virtual worlds that they don't have to uh, to physical worlds. LGBTQ people have found new forms of expression and new communities. There's, you know, potentially infinite space and, and an abundance of material goods. So I guess that potential for utopia, dystopia is there. I am myself naturally optimistic. Um, so I find myself, you know, hoping and maybe believing that the arc of 
virtual reality will also tend towards justice. But you know, I, I'm not sure that's a that's a rational feeling. Maybe it's more of an emotional feeling. Well, you know, I'm a Scottish Presbyterian, so I'm naturally pessimistic. <laughs> but your book fascinated me from cover to cover, and I have to say that the way in which you explicate the ideas of people like Descartes or Leibniz or Wittgenstein really made it uh, accessible and enjoyable and joyful. So it's not about what you're playing on your computer or what you've got on your iPhone. It's actually about the fact that there is a virtual reality out there and it's called books. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time this evening. Oh, thank you so much, Stuart. This was an extremely enjoyable and rich conversation. And thanks so much for everybody out there for, uh, for coming along and listening. <laughs>